The Maxims of Methuselah. Chapter 1. These are the teachings of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, aimed at understanding wisdom and knowledge concerning women. They provide insight into the qualities of the women he chooses. The maxims aim to impart cleverness to the naive and knowledge and discretion to young men in their relationships. Understanding and respecting women is the beginning of wisdom, but fools disregard experience and guidance. The reward of Methuselah, advice to the wise youth. Listen to the advice of your great grandfather and do not abandon the principles of those who lead a safe and focused life, unswayed by women's ways. By doing so, you will gain insight and admiration from women. Your life will be filled with joy. When you pursue a woman, she will willingly welcome you, and you will not stumble in your endeavors. I have lived for 969 years and encountered many women. I advise you not to introduce your female acquaintances to one another. Keep your romantic interests separate, as their jealousy can spark conflicts, leading to bitter arguments when your actions become known. To a woman, all other women are competitors, but men can be allies to one another. Be cautious in making personal remarks to women, as they may misinterpret or repeat them for many years to come. Never forget to compliment her on her new clothing, but also remember to appreciate the attire she wore when you first met her. Do not disclose your past romantic experiences to a woman, as she might share hers with you as well. Allow a young woman to have her way and do not oppose her desires. However, if you rob her of material possessions, she will still find contentment in your glory. If you wish to get to know a young woman, confide in her and share a secret with her immediately. This way, when she sees your photograph, she will smile and have deep, unspoken thoughts. Chapter 2. The Patriarch Speaks of His Extensive Experience with Women. He speaks about young love and advises teaching sons to respect older women in their first romantic encounters. They can learn from older women without getting entangled in relationships. If a young man falls for an immature girl, let him spend enough time with her until he becomes weary of her ways and gains discernment. If he pursues a doll-like, superficial girl, allow him to be in her company frequently, and she will teach him about women without complicating matters. Men often act foolishly without reason, but women seldom do anything without purpose. Observe her actions to understand her behavior. Do not bother explaining machinery or discussing politics with her. Her curiosity revolves around love. She writes for magazines and composes verses, but she mainly focuses on love matters. Although she writes a lot, she only publishes her own and her friends' affairs in the magazines. Imagination is not her forte. She exposes her innermost thoughts by simply placing her hand on her heart. My son, some women may come to you and advise against heeding the words of your great-grandfather, claiming he is senile and mocks women without understanding us. They might argue that the same can be said about men as well. However, you will then realize that these women lack a sense of humor. They are foolish and lack insight, so it's best not to engage in deep discussions with them. Instead, be patient, praise their appearance, and flatter them. A woman without humor is bothersome, akin to wet velvet or a mouse nibbling in the night. She is like a cigar with a torn wrapper and a leak, impossible to mend. Let me tell you, it is easier to find a pet fly in a butcher's shop than a woman who can sharpen a pencil meaning it's hard to find a woman with practical skills. Beware of women who drain your emotional energy, leaving you weary. They will listen to all your secrets but reveal nothing about themselves. They accept your gifts without reciprocation and won't reward your efforts, even if you write poems for them. Be cautious of women who don't sign their names to letters, they may have a hidden past. Seek and court a woman who communicates through ciphers and symbols, using secret names only known to you. She is clever and deserves your attention. Physical appearance matters. Curly locks and a good figure are valuable attributes. It's better to have a simple dinner where you can hear your own thoughts than attending a loud banquet with fancy food and music, where her words get lost in the noise. Moreover, it is not good for men to witness her blushing, as it may indicate her embarrassment or vulnerability, which should be respected. Furthermore, anyone who displays her in public for the purpose of showing her off or boasting commits a wrongdoing. A rebuke affects a woman of intelligence more deeply than a hundred compliments impact a foolish person. A proud woman can handle a slight offense, but how can anyone bear a criticism about her physical appearance, like a crooked nose? Flirtations may end abruptly, like the last gasp of a siphon, but true love ends more painfully, 
like the bitter drops from a Kiyandi flask. Chapter 3. The Vanity of Men and How Women Work Them. Beware of the cunning ways of women and control your vanity, as that's how she can destroy you. She will use your own words against you to bring you down. I've observed her tactics in cozy corners, where she skillfully makes a man talk about himself for an hour until he believes he's the best ever. Then, she takes advantage of his vulnerability, and he becomes ready to do her bidding, as she manipulates him. He will share his deepest thoughts and everything his rivals have said about her. Her concealed laughter will delight in her cunning success. He will shower her with gifts like flowers, precious treats, gloves, fine gold pins, theater tickets, and pay for her cab rides. Her ways are pleasant, as she treats men like children, nourishing their pride, leading to their chests puffing up in self-importance. However, a silent man frightens her, and she is astonished by his restraint. She stumbles in trying to manipulate him, and her usual tactics won't work. I knew a man from the city of Enoch who married a difficult woman. She was a shrew and complained incessantly, but he managed to subdue her. She kept on railing with grievous complaints, expressing her loneliness and frustration, waiting for him to come home late. And he replied, Yes, ma'am. Her anger was futile against him, and peace was restored in his house. My son, follow the law and exercise caution. When you invite a young woman, have her chaperone present so that you can flirt with her without fear. If you have visited her on three Thursdays, be cautious and avoid the fourth. Instead, make your call on Tuesday to keep her from assuming she knows all your routines. Don't bore her with predictability, let her anticipate your visits always. Don't let her brag to her sister. I have him under my control. Have you given the first kiss to a maiden? Write to her the next day before she gives you harsh words. Apologize, comfort her, and lessen her remorse. Offer an excuse for her behavior. Prevent her from saying, I spent the night in tears, thinking about my shame. Sleep wouldn't come to me, and I wondered what you thought of me. I am greatly sorrowful for my indiscretion. Chapter 4. Young maidens are easily fascinated by secrets, uncertain whether to share or keep them hidden, yet they can't forget them. Just as catnip pleases a kitten, reading her palm brings joy to a young woman. Predicting her future pleases her vanity. She seeks out sorcerers and fortune tellers, and though she may not fully believe, she still finds wonder in their words and shares the marvels with others. There was a maiden who said things that I didn't fully comprehend as she left her sentences unfinished. I held my tongue and refrained from questioning, thus displaying wisdom. If someone accidentally spills ice cream on her dress, they will be forgiven. However, anyone who brings up her indiscretions from the previous night will be looked down upon. It's better to have two left-hand gloves than to be seen in public with the wrong woman under the moonlight. A woman alone by the seashore is like a hat without a hat pin, she invites wild thoughts. A woman who repeatedly questions why you want to kiss her is like a cushion shedding its feathers or a molting dog that jumps on you. Being a widow for two years is harder than getting a college education, and a woman without brothers faces challenges. A teasing woman is as annoying as a squeaking shoe or walking on spilt sugar. A wise woman senses trouble ahead and avoids conflicts, but a foolish girl exclaims, don't I? A good woman would rather be the mother of a genius than the wife of a hero. Men don't overpower women with strength, it's their persistence and determination that win them over in the end. With time, any man can win any woman. When a woman claims something is insignificant, but once the man leaves, she hurries to the mirror and rejoices in her beauty. Observe a woman in love, she begins to reveal herself, not hiding her good points. Even if she is innocent, she dresses alluringly to her advantage, showcasing her beauty. She wears revealing clothing, like a thin shirtwaist with pink ribbons peeking beneath, and invites him to bathe at the seashore. However, when she appears with her hair braided, the plates falling down her back, and a blue ribbon binding it, she is at her most attractive and alluring, and the situation becomes dangerous. Chapter 5. My son, refrain from saying to a woman, Beloved, why do I not love you? Why do I feel indifferent? For you are attractive, with captivating eyes and intelligence, deserving of admiration, but my heart remains cold, and I cannot love you. Such words will distress her soul, and bitter thoughts will haunt her. Two things will trouble her thoughts, she'll wonder if you'll never love her, and she may blame herself, thinking she should have made you love her, but couldn't. 
clever men pursue love similarly, using wit, honesty, and vulnerability. They confess their feelings and embrace the danger with humor. They start at the end of the flirtation, working their way backward from the inside out. They follow one rule in the game of love, neither they nor their beloved should be made ridiculous. Beware of the soft and manipulative lover, whom women avoid. He employs devious and cunning methods, hiding his tracks, whispering in the dark, and seeking obscure places. But genuine and honest lovers will always triumph over him. Many a woman may appear comfortable with public displays of affection but resist intimacy when touched privately under the table. A brave heart can win the heart of a princess, but one who uses craftiness will only get second-rate affection. A woman may find aspects of her first love in her last, but a man often compares his current love to the one before. My son, pay attention to my advice, and make an effort to understand women. Observe her when she is with another man, for her actions with him will likely be the same with you. Do not consider any woman wise until you have received a letter from her hand. However, do not love someone you have not met in person, as a woman may present herself differently on paper than in reality. You must get to know her face to face to truly understand her. Don't be deceived by appearances or charm, as beauty is fleeting, and favors can be misleading. Instead, praise a woman who shows willingness to mend your glove, demonstrating kindness and practical care. Before pursuing her romantically, meet her mother, as time can change a person significantly over the years. Chapter 6. Do not be surprised by a woman's inconsistency, as she is made up of conflicting elements. She may be the weaker vessel, but the strong man cannot enjoy her unless she willingly consents. She will reject what she loves, seemingly contradicting her feelings at times. She is afraid of mice when they appear, yet she handles challenging situations with joy. She often asks for the impossible from men but refuses to consider their perspective unless it aligns with her own. Her ways can be deceptive and tricky, but if she chooses to be straightforward, she may be criticized for being obstinate. When she flatters a fool, people accuse her of hypocrisy. Yet, if she calls men, asking them to come over, they become angry and contrary. Her only victory lies in her defeat by her beloved. She bears agony in silence, concealing her pain with a smile. However, if a man suffers, the whole city will know about it. There are things no woman will ever know, and they shall remain hidden from her. Men won't disclose how they have acted in private theatricals, and women will speak sweet words without meaning. If a maiden loves you, she will see you as handsome and admire your features, even if you don't fit conventional beauty standards. She will be approachable and accept your invitations, always making time for you. She will seek your opinion on her new clothes and respect your judgment. She will inquire about your family, asking about your mother and sister, and may request a photograph from your childhood. She will take an interest in your interests, reading the books you read and understanding your tastes. She will remember the details of your preferences, like the sugar in your tea and the foods you dislike. She will pick threads from your garment and brush your hair. She remembers when she first met you and knows when you last called. She laughs at your jokes and knows your neckties. She pays attention to your opinions and shares them with her friends. She gives you foolish gifts, and she knows if you use them or not. She reads your letters, even when they seem cold, and recognizes your footsteps outside the door. Listen carefully to my words and heed my advice, for the world is full of women, and they are full of cunning. A man who does not approach them cautiously may fall victim to their tricks. In the attempt to misunderstand women, we often find moments of joy. Be cautious and know that a fond woman's commands are meant to be broken, and only a fool follows them blindly. When she smiles, it may not be only for you, but when she frowns, it is likely directed at you alone. If she talks much about another, take comfort in the absence of rivalry. However, if she remains silent about him, Watch her actions closely, as danger might be lurking. If she weeps, join her in tears, and her grief will be eased. Many women claim to be universal confidants, hearing men's love stories, but they don't confide in others. If a girl presses you for a secret, lie immediately. Even if there's nothing to hide, invent an appealing tale, as words will satisfy her. However, if she stops asking and respects your privacy, you may tell her the truth. My son, be cautious of a plain maiden who charms you, for she requires much cunning and uses various tactics. She doesn't expect to win easily and ensures her aim. 
she plays the sympathetic role, trying to please and doing many favors. On the other hand, the fair maiden is simple in heart, thinking highly of herself. She gives little but receives much and basks in her own beauty, tiring out men. Does a woman strive for the impossible? No, she doesn't understand the gain in that, and she scoffs at the man who desires something extraordinary. Many men have given up a good salary for a chance at fortune, but a woman prefers the certainty of what she already has. When you make a statement about women, she will immediately try to disprove it. She goes against the flow. When a woman's heart is broken, or when her love faces disaster, she retreats to the house of memory, shutting the door behind her. But if a man loses hope, he also shuts the door but eventually moves on. For all women are like Lot's wife, looking backward, holding on to the past. Chapter 8. My son, pay attention to my wisdom and learn my ways, and maidens will be drawn to you. In Ethiopia, garlands will be hung in your honor, and the damsels of Assyria will call you a deer. I have won many a maid through a quarrel when flattery was of no use, but be careful that you are in the right before you acknowledge your mistake. Women will admire your integrity. However, do not repeat the same manner of flirtation with different women, for news of it will spread, and women will mock you. Even debutantes will criticize your approach. A poem will appeal to the foolish, and a riddle will intrigue the wise. A kiss is appreciated by the chaste, and a handclasp is enough for the unchaste. A man is like a fort in a foreign land, easy to conquer but hard to keep. However, a woman of virtue is like an eel in a bathtub, difficult to acquire, yet challenging to lose. Remember to avoid competition, for if she loves another more than you, no effort on your part will prevail. If she doesn't love you at first, she never will. When you embrace her, make her feel like no other women exist. Don't mention other women, ignore them completely. Observe women in their ways, and don't be fooled by false rumors. A woman may use a lorgnon without being nearsighted, and not every woman with her waist buttoned up behind is a maid. A woman lives in a romantic future, envisioning things that may never come to pass, while a man tends to focus on the present. Her heart gives consent before her lips even speak the words, yes, and she wishes to prolong this moment of anticipation. She communicates with brevity, sending telegrams of ten words, she cannot be persuaded to say more or less, regardless of the urgency. She may say, I wash my hair, but it won't cooperate. Or complain about missed opportunities for good dinners or well-prepared homes. She may claim to value honesty in a relationship, urging her partner to tell her if he stops loving her, yet she may not be easily convinced to let go. In the company of others, she expects her child to behave properly, but when alone, he becomes more talkative. She observes and criticizes her sister's attire, noticing every detail of their clothing and accessories. She believes that once a woman has kissed someone and stopped, she becomes virtuous and unattainable, unlike any other. Chapter 9. Tell me, you naive ones, how long will you cling to the idea of platonic friendships? The skeptics will revel in your misfortune, whispering gossip behind your back. I, too, will mock your distress and laugh when passion strikes. When tears flow, I'll say, ha ha, I'll rejoice with great mirth. Then, when you seek my help, I will not answer, you'll ask for advice, but I'll withhold it. There is no escape. You rejected my counsel, despised my warnings, and now you're entangled in your own foolish ways, suffering the consequences, uttering foolish lies without explanation. But whoever listens to me shall dwell safely and be free from trouble. Women shall find him interesting and desire his company. He'll be invited to social events and enjoy free dinners. Matrons will greet him with smiles. The wise shall live in Upper Fifth Avenue, but fools shall dwell in the West Side. They'll take up residence on East 18th Street and make their calls in Harlem. Of women who cannot bear reproach, I've known over a hundred, but not one who could gracefully accept praise. Can a woman juggle both a man and a pet at the same time? One of them shall suffer jealousy. As the salt seller with a loose lid in the soup, says the matron who excessively praises her children. Beware of proposing to the wrong damsel, I'll show you the revealing signs. Avoid those who push ahead in lines, fail to shut car doors, or linger too long in dressing rooms. Stay away from those who can't say goodbye on the phone or those who take scarf pins with no intention of returning them. Chapter 10. A black corset is considered unacceptable, 
and she who leaves her hair in the comb shall be shunned by society. Do not assume a matron is happy until she reaches thirty and maintains her figure. Her sisters may criticize her clothing choices, advising her on what suits her body shape best. A woman with a perfect figure might face envy and suspicion from other women. Even a good complexion is sometimes met with doubt. To a woman, having children is seen as a shortcut to wisdom and superiority over others. Waste no time trying to deceive a woman, she is often skilled at fooling herself. When considering a woman for marriage, observe her family bathroom and its condition. It can tell you a lot about her habits and cleanliness. Avoid disclosing intimate details to others, for secrets tend to spread like gossip. Be mindful of the couch cushion, it has witnessed many curious things but remains silent and discreet. A woman and a mouse are similar in their ability to carry tales everywhere they go. Once, in my youth, I kissed a maiden from Assyria. She asked me if I kissed every woman I desired, and I answered boldly, confessing my fondness for every woman's lips. So she laughed and was comforted, not believing me, nor desiring to believe me. She made merry at my jest and was content in her pride. Offer to every woman an excuse in season, that she may clothe her embarrassment, let her not suffer for her complacence. Chapter 11. Unto a woman, her conscience is a slave, she forceth it to do her will. With what pride she vaunteth her virtue. Saying, Lo, I know I ought not to tell this thing, nor should I divulge it at all, but thou understandest. Her friend cometh with tidings, and she receiveth her with joy, saying, Thou knowest that I believe not in gossip, nor do I talk mischievously of my neighbor, tell me therefore the news, and I will not believe it. She saith, Yea, I know well that I tell not always the truth, and in her heart, she thinketh, Surely my frankness condoneth my fault. I have heard engaged maidens when they said concerning their past lovers, Yea, I thought that I loved him, but I was mistaken. And many a damsel hath besought her sister to marry a man whom she would in no wise be persuaded to marry herself. Son, there are subjective kisses and kisses objective. There are kisses seen and disgusting, and kisses felt and rapturous, but the glory of the subjective is one's, and the shame of the objective is another's. It is not by men that women are betrayed, but rather by women. Lo, I observed a prude amongst sports, and the prude was a sport also, even as the others, fearing to be different from the rest. And also, I observed a sport amongst prudes, her conduct was seemly altogether. Does a woman smoke her first cigarette because a man asks her to? No, but because other women at the table smoke, even at the dove lunch, she takes the first step. Yet the straightforward woman is the one who is the frankest, she speaks her mind. Does a woman speak platitudes and hot air? Behold, she is innocent. Every man judges a woman based on his own experiences. If she rejects him, he says, Lo, she is unattainable, but if she agrees, he simplifies it as, Behold, she does the same with every man. I tell you, a woman does not measure a man's love by kisses and sweet words alone, but by every action he takes. She is sensitive to his advances, if he touches her glove, she thinks, Lo, this is a sign of progress in his love. He examines her rings, and she wonders if he is enamored. He who you love must laugh when you laugh and cry when you cry, for if she laughs when you cry or cries when you laugh, it is a cause for concern. My son, if you want to flatter women, I advise you to avoid vague compliments. Don't say, You are beautiful, my love, you make my heart rejoice with your attractiveness. Instead, be specific in your praises, go into details, for this will bring her joy. Say to her, Love, your nostrils are proud, they show your uniqueness, and your ear is like a seashell. Your fingers' tips are cunning, and the line of your eyebrows is unmatched. See, she knows her positive and negative attributes, she knows them all, from the biggest to the smallest. Her mirror guides her, and she understands her appearance. She is also aware of the strengths of her rivals, and if she has thick wrists, she will take notice of every other woman's wrist. She wears a size 3 shoe, for it is comfortable for her. Yet when you ask, she will say, No, my size is two and a half. Do you know a woman who doesn't criticize other women's attire? I tell you, there is not a single one who cannot point out their flaws and offer them advice on what they should wear. Even if she dresses like an art student, she considers herself an authority on fashion. Many women may seem like they are trying to convince you, but in reality, they are only trying to convince themselves. 
What is quicker than a woman's mind? She swiftly jumps to conclusions, and she might not answer the exact question you ask, but rather what she thinks you mean. She won't be easily pinned down. Like a fly entangled in sticky paper, a woman who tries to justify her actions finds herself in a difficult situation. If you speak the whole truth to her, she may say, Ha ha, you are deceiving me. You haven't told me the whole story. Let me add to it. Son, be cautious and refrain from saying to a woman whom you do not know well, Lo and beware, your sidecombs are falling, and a hairpin is escaping from your tresses. Such remarks may invite her anger, and she will look upon you with fury. She has the ability to turn a compliment into an insult in the blink of an eye. When you praise her, she might misconstrue your words and take offense. Chapter 12. Listen, my son, do not be fooled by superficial appearances. Do you know a maiden who shares all her letters with her mother? Befriend her, and she will soon express her deep emotions to you. Just as the blower on the fireplace hides the flames, she will reveal her true feelings when her parents' watchful eyes are not around. If you heed my advice and keep my guidance close to your heart, all women will be as one woman to you, and understanding them will come easily. Find one woman whom you can trust, and to her who loves you most, confide your innermost secrets. She will protect you from deceitful women and expose their tricks. And when someone flatters you, she will reveal their true intentions. When you find a woman you can trust, go but always return to her. Smile at her from across the room when you are surrounded by others. When women admire you, seek her out with your eyes. Make a subtle sign to her across the dining table, she will understand its meaning. Before you dress in fine clothes and groom yourself, seek her advice. And when you leave for a social gathering, return to her soon after and share your experiences. She will interpret your dreams and understand your moods. The woman who truly loves you is wise and knows your ways. Put your trust in her, and she will guide you in understanding women. It is better to believe and be deceived seventy times seven than to think all women are false. Yes, it is more fulfilling. If you suspect her, it is better to leave her than to live in doubt, but to believe and doubt at the same time is a bitter torment. In my youth, I knew a maiden from the land of Nod, and I loved her. My friends came to me and said, Look, she is a devil, cast her off. But I replied, Indeed, I know well that she is either an angel or a devil, for in no other way could she charm me. Yet I would think her an angel while I may, for I cannot leave her. The fool says in his heart, All women are liars, but I say to you, truly, two good women friends are worth more than a million saints. Now I entered the chamber of a maiden, and there were many photographs displayed on the writing desk, mantel, and mirror. However, I did not discover my own photo. And I rejoiced, saying, Lo, I am at the head of the procession. But on another occasion, I sneaked into the chamber of yet another damsel. And behold, my photograph was displayed in a frame of fine gold. I cried aloud in shame and became hot with embarrassment, saying, Alas, I have become a gooseberry, for she uses me to her own end. I am like the geography of a schoolboy, behind which he reads the story of Bloody Mike the Avenger. She flaunts my name, fooling her friends. Listen now to my words, and pay heed to my instruction, so that you may not be deceived by the woman who seeks to ensnare you. For her ways are plain to me, and through many defeats, I have gained victory over her. In my youth, I had experiences with the women of Mesopotamia, Ethiopia, Assyria, Havila, and the lands by the Euphrates. They taught me their secrets, and I recorded their sayings on my tablets. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments, for they will protect you from the woman who flatters you with honeyed words. Beware, for this is her cunning, and through these crafts, she seeks to bind you to her side forever, even if she is innocent of guile, she has her system that will not fail. From my window, I have observed her, and I have witnessed her ways, how she ensnares the simple ones. From her first move to the end of the game, I have watched her closely. This is how she does it. She establishes a personal connection, she makes him notice her among others, she asks him to carry her coat, she places her purse in his pocket, and he becomes entangled in her service. She establishes proximity, and she makes use of propinquity. She entreats him to tie her shoe, she decorates his buttonhole, and her breath is in his face. She awakens his protective instincts, she shows her vulnerabilities so that he might comfort her. Like a barking dog and a horned cow, they have provoked a reaction. 
Chapter 13. And, he is strong, and he stills her fears, she takes his arm. She achieves a private conversation and confides in him. She pours out her heart, saying, I know not why I tell you this, for I have never told it before. But surely, you understand me, and I can trust you always. Behold, he has called for the third time, and she says, Lo, I have missed you, and all day yesterday, you were in my mind, for I had various things to say to you. When will I see you again? She establishes a secret union between them, and in the company of strangers, she says secret words to him. She refers to untellable things and builds up a past to use it. She gives him a pet name. She signs her letters, the princess in the magic tower. She desires to be treated as a man. She yearns for the simple relation of a comrade, saying, Lo, how I trust you, for you have not regarded me merely as a woman. You have not made up to me. Yet, she displays her feminine and helpless side, confessing her weakness and extolling his strength, all while secretly laughing in her sleeve. She shows an interest in all things that concern him, she inquires about his doings at the office and shows concern for his comings and goings. She reads the books he reads and consults the newspapers so that she may discuss them with him. She gets him into the kitchen, he opens beer and sardines in the evening, and she binds an apron around him while she sits upon the washtubs. She playfully swings her silk stockings on the table. She stands beside him when he opens cases, hands him the hammer and nails when he puts up her shelf, and smiles upon him. She asks for his photograph, and she steals the photograph of him as a baby, showing envy for it. She admires his shoulders and says, Lo, what a stunning profile you have. Your mouth is firm. Behold, you are distinguished. She inquires about his mother and his Aunt Jane, his little nephew, and all that are within his gates. She attempts his reform and shows an interest in his health, saying, Lo, I know well that it harms you to inhale cigarettes. Why will you not regard your health? For my sake, be careful, for if anything afflicted you, then would my heart be bowed down. Yet, it is not meet that I should stand between you and your pleasures, for I know not the ways of men, nor of their needs. Far be it from me to restrict you in your enjoyment. Yet, I beseech you to wear rubbers and warm underwear, you must not neglect for you must preserve your strength and beauty. Now she sees his bachelor apartments where he takes his ease, and she marvels at man's liberty and freedom until she says, Lo, would that I were a man also, and not a woman, for your freedom makes me envy you. Yet, who does your mending? And your clean linen, who is there that lays it out? Who cleans up your room? Who attends to you when you are sick? Who holds your hand and smooths your pillow? For it makes me fear for you. She asks him to promise her that when he is stricken, he will send for her and her sister so they may visit him and do what shall be necessary for his comfort, and they shall come gladly. And in her own house, she shows him the contrast, she makes him feel at ease in mind and in body. She waits upon him with smiles, adjusts the sofa pillow, places his smoking materials at his hand, and screens the light with a red shade. She gives deft touches to make him feel comfortable. And she says, Lo, how lovely to be a man. Would that I were free also, that I might come and go unquestioned. I abhor the feminine touch, and man's simple taste, lo, I admire it. Yes, put your feet upon the couch and be comfortable. Strew your ashes wherever you will, for it will keep the moths from the rug. And the fool thinks in his heart, Would to God I had this comfort always and my belongings ever ready at my hand. Verily it would be pleasant to be married, and a wife is a desirable thing. She defers to his taste. Yes, she makes him go with her when she selects her hat, and that which she wishes she forces him to choose for her. She heeds his words of praise concerning her attire, and the gown he does not approve she will not wear before him. She flatters his neckties, she calls his cuff links good. She provokes a quarrel. Yes, out of thin air she creates strife and disputes with him. And when he is heeded, then she humbles herself, saying, Lo, thou art right. Let me grovel before thee. Accept my apology, O Lord, for I am as nothing in thy sight. She commits an indiscretion to bind them together secretly, she relies on his honor and feels vulnerable. She provokes a struggle, and he snatches at her fiercely. And she says, Lo, I thought that thou wert a gentleman. How darest thou impute such things to me? What have I done to deserve this? She accepts his apology. She takes an interest in the women he has known, she praises them highly, extolling his discernment. She shows magnanimity and forgives him for everything. 
But when she is sure of him, she pretends to be jealous, accusing him unjustly and mocking his friends. Now she invites him to her place for their final encounter. Her plan is in place, and the end is near. She springs her last trick upon him, saying, Verily, verily, my heart is troubled, and I need your advice, you are my only friend. I am invited to visit my uncle in California for six months, and I know not whether to go or not. He persuades her not to go, he proposes to her, and she accepts him. Give her then the rewards of her hands and let her own works praise her, for she has achieved her desires and brought him to submission. Chapter 14. There are three things that are too difficult for me, yes, four that I cannot understand. The way of a woman with nerves. The way of a maid with her dressmaker. The way of a damsel bidding farewell. The way of a matron who understands the speech of babes. There are three things that never satisfy a woman. Yes, four that never say, it is enough. Her photograph. The fit of her raiment. A novel with a sad end. The wooing of her lover. For it is easier to find a woman satisfied with her mirror than a maiden content with all her names. For Susan desires to be called Hulda, and Sarah, Deborah. Two things a woman says on parting. Yes, three speeches are necessary to her. 1. I have had such a charming time. 2. It is so good of you to have asked me. 3. Now do come and see us. Hurry not a woman's favor, neither force her hastily to surrender to you. For she goes into love as she goes into the waters at the seashore. First a hand, and then a lip she goes in by littles. She does not dive, she does not leap from the pier, but by gentle shocks and cries of protest, she enters slowly. Yet when the waters of love encompass her, then is she supported. She swims in her joy, she floats on the tide of happiness. For all her lines are drawn in pleasant places. Son, when you call upon a damsel for the first time, make sure you go alone, for a first call often brings forth a miracle. Hunt not in couples, lest you do not get acquainted. Eschew letters of introduction, which are the methods of fools. Be sure she desires you, and visit her alone. She will receive you willingly. The fool tries to woo a maid with tricks before he kisses her. He touches her hand secretly, sits closer to her. But a bolder one doesn't fear, he jumps up, runs across the room, and falls upon her suddenly, before she's aware. She's astonished, and she slaps his face. But the man of understanding heeds a sign. It is revealed to him what he shall do. When he becomes three parts sure, then he proceeds. For the three parts are even this damsel, and the fourth is all women. The fool tries to woo a maid with tricks before he kisses her. He touches her hand secretly, sits closer to her. But a bolder one doesn't fear, he jumps up, runs across the room, and falls upon her suddenly, before she's aware. She's surprised, and she slaps his face. But the man of understanding heeds a sign. It is revealed to him what he shall do. When he becomes three parts sure, then he proceeds. For the three parts are even this damsel, and the fourth is all women. My dear son, if a woman confesses her love for you and you don't share the same feelings, do not abandon her or leave her in distress. Instead, try to make her laugh and keep your interactions joyful. However, if she admits to regretting her past actions, do not hold her mistakes against her. Be happy for her change of heart and refrain from reminding her of her past weaknesses. Some women can be won over with boldness and direct approaches, while others require a more patient and gentle approach. But if there is no genuine affection in her heart, no amount of pursuit will succeed. Let me tell you this truth. Not every woman who appears to be attending a social gathering is necessarily available or interested in romantic pursuits. Some may be there for innocent reasons. When you call a woman and she inquires about your activities and whereabouts, be cautious, as she might be testing your sincerity or trying to understand your intentions. I have observed the competition among young women at summer resorts and beaches. But beware, you cannot always judge a woman's popularity by the number of gifts or flowers she receives. Sometimes, such gestures are sent by her family, not necessarily by admirers. The rivalry among women can have lasting effects on their descendants for several generations. Son, do not be deceived by a woman's reserved demeanor, for even a seemingly cold-hearted woman may desire passionate courtship. And she who appears indifferent might secretly hold a high opinion of an enthusiastic suitor. 
Do not propose to a woman when she is flaunting her new dress or when she is filled with pride from recent triumphs. Avoid approaching her during moments of reigning and celebrating her victories. But when she is unwell or feeling weary, when her spirit is low and she seeks comfort, be prepared and make your affection known. After she has had a long journey and is resting, while a storm brews and thunder roars in the skies, when she's enjoying beautiful music and the wine flows freely, that's the time when you can win her heart. And a rushed wedding is worth two when taken at leisure. If she changes her hairstyle, someone may have significant influence over her, and if he shaves his beard, there is a reason. When a young woman gets engaged, she abandons many charms, and her lifelong friends discuss her. Even her dearest sisters laugh and whisper scornfully. Is her ring being wished upon? Perhaps it's just a test of your commitment. Who can withstand a ten-year-old girl? She has many uncles. Even as one who wipes his hands on a new towel or flypaper sticks to bare feet, says a woman who continually asks you if you love her. Gum can be removed from the hair, and ink under the thumbnail will eventually fade away, but a woman who talks too loudly in the streetcar cannot be changed. A maiden's first kiss comes with difficulty, like the first olive out of a bottle, requiring much skill but the rest are easy. A woman who refrains from asking troublesome questions is as comforting as a hot drink on a sleigh ride. Educating a fair damsel is a delightful experience, bringing joy to a man's heart to counsel and teach her in new ways. A man may be praised for being straightforward, according to the opinions of his brothers, but if a woman is virtuous, she alone is to be praised. Son, when you are told that it will please you more to remember the duties you've neglected for love of women than all your honors, take it to heart. The bachelor thinks he understands women, knowing a little about many, and the husband is wise in his own conceit, knowing much about one. But a woman considers them both equal in folly. Just like someone who dips the mucilage brush into the ink bottle, says he who says to a woman, Beloved, how young you look today, how well you appear. When she doesn't enjoy all people, when she scrutinizes her mirror in the morning, when she seeks the youth of the land to enslave them, these are the stages of her aging. Who is more steady than the damsel of twenty-three? Lo, she scorns the world, she writes cynically in her journal, she spits the ashes of joy from her mouth, she talks wisely to the old men and scorns babes. Yet, in another year, she returns to embroidered lingerie, she dances the two-step with ardor, she writes many letters. Oh! Marvelous are women's ways, and most wonderful are her economies. On cheap underwear and on cheap stockings and cheap boots, she economizes. Yes, from the bargain counter, she selects her gloves, but on her hats, she throws her substance away. At the mark-down sale, you won't find any veils. I admire a thoroughbred, but I detest a cheap woman. She wears a solitaire moonstone ring but neglects to clean it. Even on sleigh rides, she wears a fascinator. She keeps three hats in rotation, and their change is relentless. Scarlet turns to mauve, mauve to magenta, and her hats are ever-changing. Last year's best becomes this year's everyday hat, and this year's everyday hat will be next year's rainy day hat. The course of her hats is fixed and never alters. She puts on an old silk waist for her housework, and the fresh morning gown is left unnoticed. Her white gloves remain soiled, and the button is missing from her boots. Her Lewis can slippers are worn down at the heels, and there's a hole in her stocking. Her Jaegers bulge at the top of her shoes, and her placket gaps open, causing men to look away. Chapter 17. Women are indiscreet in anger. Age changes women's perspective. Women are often the same in their behavior. They exhibit abandon and inertia. Many tastes and preferences are common to all women. The effect of broken hearts is also discussed. Who can find a consistent woman? Where is the woman who doesn't reveal secrets in her anger? If you've quarreled with her and she hasn't betrayed you to your friends, then you can confidently say that she is honorable, even whiter than snow. The young woman yearns for chivalry, but the older woman desires impertinence. And no woman answers an important question in fewer than eleven score words. My son, listen closely if you wish to understand women. Hear my words, for the women of the Pisan are like those of the Gian and what the damsels of the Hidekel think, so think they of the Euphrates. She is like a stone on the hilltop, not easily moved. But once she starts, she goes fast and far, her destination remains unknown. She believes that all men are vain and easily flattered. Let her hold on to this belief so that she may reveal her cunning, 
her ways will become evident. Her heart is older than her head, her emotions are the mother of her reason. She remembers anniversaries to the very day, and your love will be measured by your memory. She desires many things, and she is content until she obtains them. Two things she holds dear, mystery and mastery. There are two things she cannot resist in a man. Sentiment, for she has a fondness for it, and a subtle man who provides her with good excuses. She doesn't jest at love until her heart is broken, and an unmarried damsel gains much experience. Chapter 18 On the banks of the Tigris, I came across a couple engaged in a passionate kiss. Startled, they didn't notice my presence, and I couldn't help but be amazed by the scene. The woman showed no shame and displayed the boldness of a lioness with her whelp. On the other hand, the man seemed embarrassed and quite flustered. I approached the young woman and asked, Why are you not ashamed, and why does your heart not race? She replied, When he first kissed me, I was filled with shame, and my heart pounded intensely. I felt the need to look away. But now, she continued, it's different. I've surrendered myself to this feeling, and I don't care about being judged anymore. She added, Can one experience shame twice? I was ashamed of my feelings once, but now I've let go of my inhibitions. What worse can happen to me? She assured me that she no longer cared about judgments, not even her own. She had come to terms with her emotions and had introspected deeply. Later, I encountered four other women by the river Tigris. Each of them owed me fifty shekels. The first woman seemed unconcerned about repaying, reasoning that the man I lent the money to was wealthier and could afford it. The second woman, however, brushed off the debt, claiming that there was no hurry and she would repay sometime in the future. But she never mentioned it again and didn't pay me back. The third woman faced difficult circumstances, and she came to me, expressing her desire to repay the debt but lacking the means to do so. Yet, she assured me that she had not forgotten my kindness and promised to pay me on Monday. The fourth woman, on the other hand, promptly paid the full amount and cleared her debt the following Saturday. Now there was a married woman who had a close male friend, known to her husband but not highly regarded by him, as he was overly fond of the friend. One day, the young man wrote to the married woman, inviting her to have lunch together on Wednesday at a restaurant. They met as planned and had a virtuous and innocent conversation during their lunch. That night, the woman told her husband, My dear, today while I was walking in town, I happened to meet my friend, and he invited me to eat with him. So, I went with him. Her husband nonchalantly replied, All right, and proceeded to read his newspaper. In a woman's eyes, a lie is but a half-truth. Chapter 19. My son, if you wish to flatter women, heed my wisdom, and do not be afraid or hesitate. For a woman is like a puzzling riddle with no clear answer. When dealing with a foolish girl, engage in serious conversation, but with a wise young lady, you may adopt a light-hearted approach. Address a married woman by her given name, so she may momentarily forget her age. Do not praise a woman for what she already possesses, but instead, admire her for what she does not have. Your reward shall be greatly appreciated. A witty woman for her beauty, and a comely damsel for her intellect. A wise woman for her jests, and a frivolous maid for her literary criticism. Praise a woman for her skills, whether it be a pianist for her cookery or a housewife for her mathematics, and you shall win their favor. But a mother with one child shall be flattered for that alone, for there the surest path lies. For I give you good advice, do not abandon my teachings. Unless she opens her heart to you, revealing all she knows, her love for you may not be whole, and she may keep some things hidden. When she presents many reasons, she can be easily persuaded, but if she gives you only one, cease your insistence. When she stops using your surname and addresses you as, you, be cautious, as this marks the end of formality. When she encourages you to talk about yourself, she might either admire or despise you. Do not judge a woman's beauty merely by looking at the back of her head in the street, lest you be mocked by the wise. A thoughtful gesture carries more weight than many compliments, and a well-crafted letter can work wonders. There are two kinds of women who smoke cigarettes, those who wish to try and those who indulge in two or more. When she seems uncertain, she might be hiding strong convictions, and a stubborn woman can often be mistaken. Until she shares these words with you, three letters have I written to you, and burned them with fire, for my heart misgave me, you have not truly won her heart.
the woman engaged to you should have no other romantic engagements. Before you commit to marriage, engage her in a game of poker, and you shall learn much about her. Listen to the advice of those who have loved before, for I have known more than 555 women in my youth, and my fame was great among them. If you wish to understand women, you must know both the best and the worst among them. For the woman who knows the least is often the one with the darkest heart, and the angel and devil are like sisters to one without experience. Wickedness wears the cloak of innocence, and the innocent baby stares from the deceitful woman's eyes. She hungers after the naive youth, she studies his ways and acts modestly. She pretends to be shocked, she casts down her eyes, and she delights in being taught. She laughs in her sleeve, she amuses herself with his innocence, and when he is gone, she reveals his foolishness to others. Chapter 20. Every way of a maiden with a man is subtle, yes, it is exceedingly wise. As she works on her new garments, sewing on the inside so it may not be seen from the outside, so she works on him. And when her work is completed, she enters and takes possession. I observed her on a dark night when she walked abroad with her young man, and she wore no other white shirt waist. Nay, it was of somber hue, that men might not see her. For she had not succeeded in her wiles upon the golf links, nor in the ballroom, nor upon the piazza, for he feared her much. Yes, he was timid being simple and free from guile. But she said in her heart, Lo, what shall I do that he may be emboldened? I will lead him beneath a tree to rest in its shade, and I will sit beside him, meekly. And it was a dark night of stars, having no moon. Then said that damsel, I would that there were a moon, that it might shed its light upon us. And he answered her, saying, Thank heavens there is not a moon. And he drew nearer. And she smiled to herself, saying, Now is my time come, long have I waited. Now there were three damsels sitting on three chairs, and each damsel had a youth beside her. And each youth placed his arm along the back of his damsel's seat, privately, and each damsel observed his act, keeping her counsel. And the first damsel waxed wrath at the youth's impertinence, and she leaned back. Then with her eyes, she darted fierce glances at him, so that he was rebuked, and he took away his arm. And the second damsel was rejoiced in her youth's ardor, she leaned back and enjoyed herself. And the young man did not withdraw his arm. But the third damsel knew not whether she was pleased or whether to wax wrath, for she was one without experience. So she made no sign, pretending not to notice, and she sat erect all the evening, suffering. Like the annoying sound of an alarm clock going off at 7 a.m., says she who keeps saying, I told you so. But a woman who hesitates and is always late is like a step missing on a staircase, causing frustration. I visited a matron's house, and to my disappointment, I found a bore there. And he lingered. While his back was turned, she stifled a yawn in her kerchief, hoping he would leave so she could be alone with me. After many hours, she finally decided to leave, but he kept talking and delaying his departure. The matron began to gossip incessantly, telling him long stories, trying to hide her real intentions. I was greatly puzzled and amazed by the whole situation. Chapter 21. In my house, I stood by the window and looked through the casement. There, a table was spread with men and women sitting around it. And behold, every woman flirted with her neighbor, and the men reciprocated. Two by two, they flirted until the coffee was served, and I observed them closely. Each woman secretly watched the others, noting who was in love, bored, or quarreling with someone. They discreetly observed everything happening at the table, but their actions were subtle, they kept flirting throughout. But the men seemed oblivious, focused only on their respective partners, paying no attention to others. They attended to their own affairs, looking straight ahead, minding their business, and showing no interest in the interactions of others. After coffee was served, the women excused themselves, leaving the men behind, going to their rooms and gazing at their reflections in the mirrors. The women engaged in gossip, sharing untruths about the men, questioning each other, and using sweet names for their rivals. Meanwhile, they anxiously waited for the men to join them. Yet, the men leisurely smoked together, enjoying each other's company, engaging in thoughtful conversations. None of the men talked about the women in the house, nor did they mention any woman's name or discuss each other's flirting. Time passed joyfully, and none of the men wished to leave the table or the cigars they were smoking. 
until the host finally intervened, announcing, it is time, for the ladies await us. The men then made their way slowly into the drawing room of the house. The women eagerly awaited the arrival of the men with smiles on their faces, watching the door to see who would catch their attention. One woman, positioned on the couch in the drawing room, made space for the guest of honor, and he joined her, clearly pleased with the special treatment. The other women also smiled, though they remained silent, their minds busy with quick and unspoken thoughts. Give her the recognition she deserves for her efforts, and let her own accomplishments speak for her in the gatherings of the esteemed. For this is often the nature of a woman, she may wink playfully or shed a tear, claiming innocence and denying any wrongdoing. Be mindful that in her eyes, there is a significant aspect worth considering, whether it pertains to her affection or someone else's. These are the wise words spoken by Methuselah, the son of Enoch, in the 960th year of his life, to his great-grandson Shem, upon reaching adulthood. So that he may understand women and learn from his experiences with love.